This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. When I first began this show, 12 and a half years ago, I had a short list of photographers I wanted to sit down and talk with. I've been lucky in that I have succeeded in doing that on several occasions, even as my short list seems to get longer and longer. One of the names on that original list was Jeff Mermelstein. Though his name may not be easily recognized by the average person, among photographers, Jeff is known for his amazing talent and breadth of work. Some of you may have discovered him for the first time while watching the documentary Everybody Street, which examined the long history of New York street photography. But many of us discovered Jeff through his first book, Sidewalk, a collection of his New York street photography. He brings an insightful and whimsical eye to the genre, which continues to this day as he embraces both a smartphone and Instagram. I'm so pleased to finally have him as a guest on the show, and I hope that this conversation leads you to discover even more about Jeff Mermelstein. Thank you for making time for me. I have to tell you, um, you've been on my short list for a very long time of people who I've wanted to interview for, for the show because I have loved your work. You know, I, I know you did, haven't done a lot of interviews in the, in, in the past, so I've always mm. been really curious to hear more about you and your, and your process. So when I saw that you were going to be in San Francisco at the Street Photography Festival up there, I was very, very excited. So I'm, I'm really glad that I had a chance to meet you and, and get, to, get to know you a little bit and also, also have an opportunity to uh, learn more about you and your work. So, so thank you for making time for me today. Well, no, I'm flattered uh, to be uh, here with you. So, Jeff, it's kind of interesting for me because you are a photographer who has sort of, even though you are a pretty dedicated street photographer, you've You've also earned a living as an editorial and, and a commercial photographer, but you've always seemed to have been drawn back to the street. And what is your fascination with that, even though in terms of earning a living, your use of the camera takes you elsewhere? Well, I think one of the key uh, trains of thought uh, revolves around this, even as a very young man, meaning in my early 20s into my mid-twenties when um, the notion of earning a living um, increased in its uh, unveiling uh, of, of being necessary, uh, I, uh, from the very get-go, always felt that the work that I would show to a person that I would potentially work for would be the work that I made on my own. In other words, I never really created a portfolio to get work, mm. and I always showed my street work. I remember... Uh, one very clear uh, exchange uh, with Alice Rose George, who at the time was at Fortune magazine. And I really wasn't regularly working for magazines at the time. I would say that was the middle 1980s. And I went in there with a, with a box of, at the time I was making my own Ciba chromes myself in my closet. And, uh, and I brought it, and they were all street photographs made on my own initiative. And I showed her that box of prints, and the next day I got a call from Alice to go make a picture for Fortune magazine. So very early on, it became very evident that that would be the right path for me, although it proved to be a harder path. But in the long run, it became the more rewarding path because by showing work that is very personal and generated by myself, not even being paid by anybody, kind of uh, enriched my career to take me to places that I wouldn't have been uh, thought of myself into situations that I wouldn't have been able to get into otherwise, where film and processing and flights and hotel rooms would be paid for. Mm -hmm. and, and quite often, luckily, I was able to make a picture uh, that would enlarge my bigger body of work, my personal work. And that is because the picture editor identified uh, my point of view and then ascribed an assignment where my point of view would be applicable for their purposes, which is rarer, but it was and still remains out there, although to a lesser extent. Does that make sense to you? No, it makes perfect sense. But you, yeah. know, you were still fairly young and going in with that personal work rather than going in with a portfolio is sort of 
antithetical. Oh, but uh, it, 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 it was a, it was a portfolio. Yeah. What, what do you what do you, what do you what do you mean? Oh, you know, because I I sometimes think that young photographers, when I see their portfolios, okay. they're trying to prove that they're capable of creating the kinds of photographs they're seeing in the magazines and the newspapers. And that's, that's and then, exactly. I, it was instinctive for me, but it wasn't like I had to go to the library and read about this point of view, but that's exactly what I didn't want to do. Mm, okay. And I, and, I, and I wasn't alone. I was aware. As an even younger man, my first foray into editorial uh, reportage photojournalism was I had a, a, a glamorous part-time job in a dark room at a magazine called Geo, and that was in 1982. And uh, at the time, it was uh, pre-digital, so I shared a part-time job with another woman, and we alternated days and so on. And the primary function of that job was to take uh, the 35 millimeter, mostly, not always, but dominantly 35 millimeter transparency jobs that photographers had done uh, on assignments and make black and white what they call stats uh, mm-hmm. to size uh, and position for layouts for art directors. So I became completely embedded in, um, in that workflow. Of course, it was pre- uh, pre-digital. And Geo Magazine wasn't just a run-of-the-mill magazine. It was uh, mainly illustrated by mag- members of Magnum and even people like the, the best of photographers uh, of the reportage ilk uh, that also did magazine work. And Magnum, too, has, I think, uh, recognized that process. If you think about many of the Magnum members over the course of their history, uh, they have that same equation, don't you think? Oh Yeah, yeah, because I think so many of those photographers came from approaching photography from a very personal perspective. Yes. That, it, that, that there wasn't sort of, uh, oh, let me create the kinds of pictures that will get me work. That's, so that's, that's my point, because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm candid, open, and honest. I hope I'm not perfect, but uh, it's not an original train of thought. Like, for example, when I said... Uh, talked about me going to Alice George with my street work at the time. In other words, I, I learned and picked up on, on it and because of that. I think certainly in part experiences like a, I don't know, like a 23 year old in a dark room. Yeah, I think, I think one of the reasons that people sort of question or, or are hesitant to do what you did then and, and even now yeah. is, is partly because that kind of imagery usually doesn't find its way into magazines or newspapers. The skill set that's involved in creating those images, however, are invaluable to creating that kind of work. So I think that yeah. it's making, bridging that connection that even though the work is primarily produced on the street, the skills and the, the, the practice that's necessary in order to effectively produce those kinds of images consistently are going to be invaluable when it comes to doing assignment work. And I think that that yes. is what that an editor who first gave you those initial opportunities probably recognized in your work. Right. I, and I, I think that and they will always remain uh, to be to, and they were very specific personalities and they will always remain to me to be very special in my you know formative years. It took decades of evolution. Like if, some, if a magazine calls you to go take a picture in your ilk and you, let's say, get on an airplane to Cleveland from New York and you have to do, I don't know, whatever it is. Uh, let's say it's a 15 minute opportunity to get a picture of someone doing something. You have to evolve skills that enable you to, to do that so that you get paid. In other words, you don't have the luxury of walking around all day. There's other constraints. So that's, that's, that's the anxiety and the stress. That's the work of commercial work, which is very hard. Very hard. So what were the, some of the skills that you learned on the street that became invaluable when you were given those assignments where you were? I think more so than the word skills from being had on the street for me was uh, the evolution of a point of view. Let's call it a, a vision, a way, a style, a flavor in general uh, 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 of my picture making. Let's call it quirky offbeat. Let's call it funny. Let's call it sad. Let's call it real. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, oh, whatever we want to mix together in a salad of words. But what I feel that, and once again, I'm not alone, but I was one of the people that I felt in terms of someone calling me on the on the phone and, and go make a picture in a... Uh, in an appliance store of people uh, shopping for an appliance that a writer was writing about for Fortune magazine, 
uh, I would go in there with quite a uh, specific way of using Flash hmm. in, in a way that was my quote unquote secret. Uh, and that is, I would always have break my light. So I would use Flash for the most part, not always, but most of my magazine work was Flash filled. And hmm. to me, that was a solution to be able to not worry about a, a, a paramount hurdle in, you know, commercial assignment work, you know, what's the lighting going to be like and all this and this and this, right. you know, so, and, and I really pushed that, that look of the flash. I personally adopted the, the Ouija Arbus primitivism and recognized that uh, and remain obsessed with that, but that became a, uh, an invaluable tool in my, in my grab bag uh, for magazine assignment work. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's, it makes perfect yeah. sense because it was yeah. it was part of using the skill, well, not skill, or methodology of of, of problem solving, which yeah. is absolutely essential when you are presented with an assignment that has any any you know any variety of different obstacles that stand in the way between you being able to get the photograph, whether it's time the, restrictions. The, yeah, the, pardon yeah. me. The last obstacle you want to have is that there's not enough light or. <laughs> You know, if I if I if I have um, an even playing field of uh, knowing I got light, mm-hmm. okay, and if I got flash, even I could freeze people or you know, most that whole motion thing, it, it's a great tool, and it's a great look too. You were studying biology um, yeah. in college, and I read that uh, your mom wanted you to be a dentist. Yeah, and so there was this whole sort of track for you to have a more What's the right word for it? A more conventional, conventional, con- conventional career. But why didn't you take that that path? And what led you to want to use the camera as your means of earning a living? Another very good question. Backtracking to my mom wanting me to be a, a dentist, I don't see that till this day with any kind of negativity. My parents are Holocaust survivors, and my father went maybe at the most to sixth grade. My mother not even maybe fifth grade. And from from their point of view having come to this country with maybe $17, I think literally. So from their point of view, uh, and not having an education in fine art, at least certainly not in a formal way of any kind, uh, for them to really grasp and understand um, uh, what it would be to be an artist uh, was out of their, it wasn't in their world. Uh, what their primary concern for their son and other children uh, was how do you make a living? And it's not a unique scenario. It's, 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 it happens to generations and generations of all kinds of people. So that's where all that comes from. And it's quite understandable. Help me now with exactly what you're looking for after that. Well, you know, because a lot of people have that moment, especially earlier in their lives, yeah. where yeah. they go to college and the ex- and you can have had any any array of dreams of, you know, becoming a firefighter, oh. becoming an actor, oh. and then you reach oh, that age and everyone is sort of going, okay, what are you going to do now to earn a living? Yes, we told you you oh. could be anything that you want, but yeah. now you got to get realistic and make yeah. a reasonable well, okay. choice. Okay, so that's very specific. I was actually very good in biology for whatever reason. So that plus my parental uh, influence steered me in a pre-med, let's say, kind of situation in college. I was very unhappy. And it's probably, in hindsight, a really good thing that I went through that unhappy uh, cycle because towards, or in my sophomore year in college, having been uh, uh, already skilled enough with the fundamentals of photography, I was one of those kids in high school. I was one of the high school itinerant photographers. My brother bought me a camera when I was 13 uh, for my bar mitzvah. So by 14, certainly I had a dark room. So I was loading steel reels or Patterson reels and and developing and then film. And then in high school, I was one of the itinerant photographers for the newspaper and the yearbook. So I was, quote unquote, a photographer, but I didn't know what photography was. Mm -hmm. Uh, So sophomore year in college in my pre-med time period, a very uh, kind of a very, very uh, unhappy young man, uh, just not really liking the, the, the biology stuff and the chemistry and all that stuff was really not for me. I started uh, taking a class with a man named Nathan Farb, uh, a photo one class. And that was a miracle time for me and coming at me at the right time. Nathan opened up the whole world of what photography could be. Uh, This was 1977. He had us by uh, Robert Franks, the Americans. He had been a friend of Diane Arbus during those years. And so he gave us, 
he kind of channeled the whole Diane Arbus thing, uh, Emmett Gowan, and these are just some of the figures that I remember from all those years ago. So it was Nathan that opened up what photography could be. And I remember, uh, and I was just crazy, I was already obsessed. Uh, it just happened as it does for some of us. And I remember going to the college pub one night with some of my friends at the time, and we all had different kinds of personalities and interests. None of the others were photographer sorts. But I remember there being a pitcher of beer, and I, I said to my friend, his name too was Jeff, I said, I want to move to New York and work for Life magazine. And so that came from a couple beers and from somewhere else, I'm sure. So it just kind of like percolated, you know. And then I applied and received an internship at the ICP in New York in 1978. And that was a life-changing event for me, too. So I ended up moving to New York in 78. Uh, I had a one-year internship at the ICP, which in those years was on 94th and 5th Avenue, and it was a much different place. There were maybe 11 or 12 of us. We had artists and residents that included um, A.D. Coleman, Eugene Richards, Mark Feldstein. I took a workshop with a man named Gary Winogrand, uh, I had no clue as to really who he was. I didn't know how to gauge or really comprehend it at the time. I was just mm -hmm. too naive. But I was there, and I remember his interaction and what he even showed to us, Bill Brandt and Walker Evans and, and Robert Frank. And we walked around with this Mr. Winograd, and I, I just was immersed uh, into this really rich you know, uh, environment of photography at a very formative time. I became obsessed with Lee Friedlander. I became obsessed uh, to a lesser extent, but also with uh, Stephen Shore's uh, earlier work and, and many others. But Friedlander really took over, as well as uh, Winograd at that time. And I was 20, uh, 21. And yeah, I think that, that, that passion, especially when you've had the experience of being unhappy, and, yeah. then, you have a, and then you have that spark that you, where you realize, God, I, I could have yeah. something... Not just something better, but something that I found that has, something that I love. Yeah, it's not corny. I, I did. So one of your first assignments was to uh, photograph animal actors. How did you it, get it's that? Very, gig? It's, it's very specific. I was working, as I said earlier, in a dark room three days a week, and I was always taking pictures. Of course, there was an art director and a picture editor. At the time, it was all chrome, so we would have a slide. We would have a room to project slides. It was really quite wonderful even in memory. I kept uh, evolving a slide tray, and I kept showing the art director and on occasion the picture editor. And they told me that if I came up with an idea, they would present it to the editor-in-chief. And I came up, I think the source was People Magazine did something related to animal acting. And I said to myself, well, that, that'd be fun. Animals, anything is fun for a photographer. And the, and, and the angle of uh, or the point of view of a, uh, animals in, uh, in TV and advertising and movies, uh, sounds like that could be fun and maybe something people would want to see. I proposed that like maybe a one piece of paper, uh, and they gave me the assignment like in a day. And what was that experience like? I mean, because, you know, uh, I think that, WC it Fields was said... Brand, it, it was uh, all brand new to me. I went to L.A., actually, uh, Hollywood, Photographed uh, the Merrill Lynch bull on set, Lassie, one of the Lassies with Rudd Weatherwax, Benji, Morris the Cat. Uh, I had a whole session with Morris the Cat here in, Law, um, here in New York, uh, which became the cover of the magazine. So all of a sudden I was an animal <laughs> <laughs> photographer, which is another story for another time. But uh, it, just, that, it just happened. When it comes to you photographing in the, in the street, a lot of people talk about trying to be invisible and, you know, trying to be sort of a fly on the wall. But, you know, you're over six feet tall. You're really hard to miss um, mm. when people are sort of walking down uh, down the street um, and you're there wielding your, your, your camera. Did you see, you know, just your, your own physicality as an advantage uh, when it came to photographing in the streets of New York? Never thought of it as being an advantage. But I never really thought of it as being a, a disadvantage, other than the fact that I'm a man. As the years progress, I've become an older man. So I think that's a, that's a, di a disadvantage as a street photographer. But I never really thought about my size, you know. I think maybe more important than size is demeanor and presence and what you exude, posture, karma, you know. That's how we all perceive each other as we sit on the train or wait for the light to change on the corner. Uh, we all kind of feel it out. We feel threat. We feel... So I think it's more that than size. It's interesting because I've seen a video of you. I think it was probably done 
20, 30 years ago of you on the streets of New York photographing. And it was really yeah. interesting to see how you sort of moved through the scene, which is very fluidly. And it's and it seems like the sea of people were just like flowing around you is the way that yeah. I sort of perceived it. And when I look at uh, my uh, Joe Meyerowitz as, as another example, he's, he's always doing this little dance, uh -huh. you know? And it's yeah, always yeah, kind yeah. of interesting to see how different photographers occupy a physical space when they're photographing on the on the street. Yeah. Talk to me about just how it how you like to feel when you're in that zone when you're photographing on that street is with respect not so much with the actual taking of the actual photographs but in terms of, you know, your state of mind and your physicality physicality when you're when you're shooting. I think the, I think part of the work of uh, of being a street photographer is, is it's a little bit of a corny phrase, but it's not a bad phrase. That is finding a zone. So part of the work of a street photographer is to go out there, and that in itself is a, an accomplishment <laughs> to go out there on your own, uh, and then to be there, and then to put yourself into a place in your mind and in your body that is completely loose. And like being able to be clearly receptive to whatever might happen. I'm not musical at all. I'm not schooled in music at all. Uh, but it must relate somehow to how musicians get or are or feel, particularly maybe even jazz musicians. You got to get into like a, 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 groove, a groove, a cadence. You got to be careful with what's going on in your head. It's quite complex. It's quite a ritual. And it's very serious. And it's uh, ultimately work. A dis it's discipline. It's a it's a carrying out of an obsession and and, and focus. And you really got to find that zone. There are a few things that I love more than hitting the streets with a camera, like our guest Jeff Mermelstein. I find something special and intoxicating about creating photographs from the random theater that exists on the street. I especially enjoy sharing my personal approach with others and helping them to discover how to find their own voice on the street. I have two workshops left in the year. One is in New York and the other in New Orleans. In each workshop, we explore each of these great cities from a photographer's point of view. I'll teach you how to get past any fear and anxiety you may have working on the streets, and you'll learn to see and photograph people and scenes based on light and shadow, line and shape, color and gesture. Within a very short period of time, you will discover a whole new way of seeing. To find out more and to sign up for these courses, click on the link in the show notes or visit our website at thecandidframe.com. Hope to see some of you there. So what are the, so some of the things that you do to help you to get into that, to get into that place once you hit, hit, hit the streets? I, I try to shut off my thinking about, oh, our boiler's broken or, you know, hurdles that are problematic, but ultimately not problematic. You know, moment to moment, life, family kinds of things, money or a bill or utility bill that was overcharged or all these little things, you know. So I guess maybe I deal with it by... It, try, trying to maintain that, that work as to be fun somehow. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's not fun to like do it, you know? Like going on, I, in my case, I need to go on the subway to get usually where I photograph. So that's like maybe harder than like once I'm out there, it's okay. But then I have all the surprise, you know? You, you mentioned today that, um, um, that being older is a disadvantage. Why do you say, why do you say that? Well, the reason I said it then in this interview is that uh, when someone looks at a, a man that's uh, nearly 61 years old and sees that man taking a picture of someone doing whatever it is without asking permission, that's just weird to many people. And it's understandable. It is a little weird, you know. It's, uh, it's certainly legal, and in my mind it's quite ethical, but with many people it's not. It's just, it's just you know, it's just the nature of the way it is. If you're 26 versus 61 in doing that, I think people would look at you differently. I just, I don't know. Doesn't that make sense? No, I think it does. I mean, yeah. somebody sees yeah. a young person with a, uh, with a, with a camera, they, they assign 
a sort of innocu- innocuousness to it. Oh, it's yeah. probably a student or something like that, or a tourist or something like that. But you know, with age, there seems to be a little more sense of well, why are you doing it. Why? And, yeah. 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 Well, why? Uh, and I think I do. Th- of, I do think there's an advantage for a. Uh, 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 there's an advantage to be a woman as a street photographer, for sure. One of the things that, that I think has changed, though, is that because so many people are taking photographs with their phone, that there's a, me. <laughs> yeah, there's a greater yeah. there's a greater awareness of where photos end up. And I think that 30 mm. years ago, when people took photographs, they weren't really it really wasn't a concern. But now, because everyone knows people are posting to Instagram or to Facebook or whatever yeah, yeah, site yeah. it is, they immediately think about not just their photograph being taken, but it having a destination, which I think yeah. makes people a little more sensitive to it than it would, would have been several decades ago. And I, I think there were two other things that happened that kind of changed the uh, the whole atmosphere. And that is uh, Lady Di, when she uh, was killed in the car accident in the tunnel. Mm-hmm. And it was all about the paparazzi basically having been responsible for that. In the main, in many mainstream eyes or perceptions, I think that fed a certain identity to a photographer. You have to understand that we are unlike most people in our perception and understanding of a photojournalist, let us, let, or certainly a fine art or, or documentary photographer. People in general don't contemplate or need or have to contemplate that. That's kind of a semi elitist kind of characterization Mm -hmm. so what i'm saying is that like with the lady die thing paparazzi is just he's a that's a photographer and so i think that fed a certain kind of negativity about photographers and then of course 9-11 happened and that fed a whole different kind of paranoia and fear you know you know mistrust shall i say do you you find that it's especially in new york that it's become more difficult for you to do what you do I find it easier in New York than elsewhere because uh, New York is so is so it's so dense, it's so crazy, so thick with all, all kinds of stuff, and, and and the sheer amounts of people somehow I think dissipate the problem hmm. in a, in a relative sense. Let's say uh, for you know, of course, you get to know your own territory too, so that's another part of the equation. But if you're standing on the corner of 57th and 5th, when you most any time of the day, there's going to be literally between all four corners, maybe I don't know, several hundred people, literally, you know. So it's different than when you're on, let's say, the busiest intersection, even in San Francisco uh, or Portland uh, or or LA. So you were recently in San Francisco. So how was yeah. that experience for you, photographing in San Francisco as opposed to? Well, I was, I, I, my primary reason to be in San Francisco was to do a workshop. So that occupies a certain amount of your uh, mindset, dominates, you know. So it was in a certain way peripheral, but I, 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 I'm so religious in my practice of working that I made sure I went out as much as I could, which wasn't very much. But even within a few days, I started to learn some corners that the street guys liked out there and became it became fun. But uh, I didn't have the magnitude of, of, of New York. But pictures can be made anywhere. Is there something that you sort of keep an eye out for to sort of jumpstart your, your seeing when you're out there? Like for me, what I tend to do is when I, when I go out to shoot, I just start looking at light and shadow. I don't look oh. for a specific subject matter. I just look for that to sort of begin my process of seeing uh-huh. and taking photographs. Do you have something that you use as a sort of a device to get you into that, into I think that those, groove? Those devices for me become or manifest or become concrete or literal only when I become a little bit more desperate. Mm. Because ideally for me, uh, I, I really like to free fall. It'd just be open to the serendipity and surprise, potential surprise of it all, which is uniquely difficult. But if, and because that's uniquely difficult, sometimes I, you know, that you, that could get you in a certain way kind of sad or let's say even frustrated. So maybe more so for me than light, than sh- well, sometimes shadows, sometimes I'll get into like a shadow thing or, but maybe more so like that late day golden sunshine uh, in New York, <laughs> part of me in New York at this time of the year, like 7 p.m., get that sun setting in the west, throwing this beautiful, on a, on a clear day anyway, this kind of very warm summer light. So sometimes pedestrians bathe in a particular light will be enough to satiate at least I'm doing something, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes just because you're doing it, something might happen. You know, that's part of street photography, I think. 
you're one of the um, a photographer who um, has really sort of embraced Instagram after a long yeah. tradition of doing of more you know traditional outlets of photography, and it seems like you've gone full full bore with that. What's been yeah. the appeal to you of sharing your images on that on that platform? I don't know. More than two years ago, I got a text from a, a, a great friend, a, a friend of mine named Simon Johan. He's a great artist. His work is very different than mine. And he suggested I check out Instagram. He thought it would be appropriate for my work. I was turned off by the name with Instagram. It sounds to me like Target or Costco. <laughs> it's, it's like a logo of, I don't know, not even Chevrolet, hardly. So it had like a tacky identity in my stubborn mindset. But I think the timing was right in that uh, I wouldn't say I was bored, but for all, I'm sure for many reasons, I was ready to try something that would be quite different, even radically different. And then I uh, communicated with varying colleagues of mine who I have great respect for in terms of uh, both, both personness and intellect. And I said, heck, I'm going to try this. And uh, I went out with my iPhone and I made one picture and I posted it. And then I got, I don't remember, let's say, a couple likes. And that was kind of cool. I, I like that people like my picture. And uh, I like that. And then I started to make another picture. And then I think what was profound in addition to that and maybe ultimately more so is this camera, smartphone camera thing. Uh, and I've always had an affinity and an obsession for, uh, for the snapshot aesthetic. And I've always searched for the uh, camera that would be easiest to use, simplest to use, quickest to use, and stealth, most stealth-like to use. And went through many uh, point-and-shoot cameras of all kinds, uh, in addition to the Leicas and everything else. But I realized, for me, as to others, that the smartphone is revolutionary as a camera. It's like a new, it's a new snapshot machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that really, it, it, it really shook up my infrastructure as a picture maker, that I could walk out the door with this phone in my pocket and make pictures so rapidly and so quickly and so deftly was a game changer. Did you, know? you find so that, that? So that coupled with the, uh, the whole idea of sharing work and using Instagram as a medium really fed I, I, ultimately my creative drive, I think. Did you find that the use of the camera phone led you to make photographs that you might not have made previously with another type of camera? For sure. I think the phone sees differently. It, per it performs differently. And I think it, it often t can take a picture ahead of itself. Maybe a hard thing to understand. And it's not really hard. It's like, it's so fast, it could be like ahead of itself. And the truth is, too, it's, you know, there's no expense to it. It's free. They're like snippets. Yeah. You know, and some people have asked me, are these like sketches or are these the final images? It's, a, I think, a, a, a fair curiosity. Uh, and I never had that in mind. They're not templates. They're like, uh, I really, I've embraced the notational quality, the snippet like uh, fragmentation uh, that the, uh, that this enables. One of the most interesting series that you've been producing and posting on Instagram are these photographs of people's text messages on their phone. Yes. Um, how did that all come about, and what's your fascination with that? That all came about just like the way anything else in my life has come about, certainly creatively speaking. I didn't sit in my office with a number two pencil and a piece of paper. Uh, I, I was pushing my, uh, let's call it, the work that I presented uh, on Instagram prior to that, in such a powerful, obsessive way that I could say I've never really worked as hard. Even as a 32-year-old, a, a I would be and still, I, and still am out there hours at a time. And that's because it, uh, of the fun of it, I'm certain. That is because of the, uh, not the easiness of it ultimately, but because of the, uh, the fun of it, the enjoyment of making the pictures. So just by... Being out there one day, and I remember where, and I, I just I, I just saw this woman texting, and I, I didn't even think about it on a conscious level. I just took a picture of it, and I came back, and I read it, and I posted it. And you've gotten some pretty intimate conversations that people are having on their on, yeah. their, on their text, which are, I think, really uh, surprising. And it's given rise to a whole conversation in terms of privacy, which has always sort of 
pervaded the whole issue of street photography, um, especially for people who are not familiar with sort of the genre and this whole idea of taking photographs of strangers without their permission, so on and so forth. Have you had, and, and I've read some articles that gave a little pushback to what you were doing in terms of taking photographs of these people's conversations in the forms of text on their phone. What's been your response to uh, some of the things that you've, that you've seen written about what you're and what you're doing. Well, I try not to get overly engaged, but I am aware, certainly to some extent. Are you talking about the negativity or the positivity? Uh, both. <laughs> of course, I enjoy the positivity. In respect to the negativity, uh, one of the things that goes through my mind is that I, I never uh, will share publicly anyway uh, an image in which there is an identification of, the per- of a person and, uh, that's communicating anything both ethically and certainly legally. And so I have no um, no problem or discomfort. I mean, we're all, if, if something's in the public domain, uh, including myself, uh, you're, you're, you're in the public. If you don't want to be seen or not seen doing anything in particular, you know, you shouldn't do it, and including myself and perhaps yourself. Mm-hmm. And there's really no more aggressiveness than like being in the front of a person and doing like a William Klein or any other, uh, you know, kind of a aggressive picture maker artist and putting like a flash in someone's face or anything else. I mean, without asking, I mean, so it's all, and I have great respect for that kind of work too. So it's, it's street photography and it's ultimately all only about uh, recording a certain time you know that we're we're going through and and that's a that's a beautiful thing if we could capture uh be it in that kind of manner or otherwise something about who we are at a given time uh that's a, a that's a priceless thing as as a street photographer it's a documentation uh, uh as to who and how and where we are at a certain time mm-hmm. another thing i noticed recently without once again without trying to think of seeing something like this i'm walking down the street and uh, in New York, as I'm sure in other urban areas, you have these pl- uh, police surveillance like dome. Right. They're yeah. like, y- right. So, um, and of course, in New York, there's a lot of them. Like those cameras in there are so high res, they're like satellite quality or something. I'm not technical, so, but I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So, like, they could probably see, like, you know, if I cut my toenails or not. <laughs> and there's like, there's a whole central station somewhere in the city looking at all of this. I mean, is that okay? Well, I was just watching this video about these little sort of like robots with cameras that go yeah. through and they're able to uh, identify people, facial recognition. They're basically mm. something out of some science fiction movie where they're like, they're, these, they're patrolling. So they're not yeah. only looking for people who are doing things they're not supposed to, but using facial recognition, they can identify who people are. So yeah. you can be out there thinking you're completely anonymous and, you know, we're uh, coming into an age where, when you're not. And then and you go on your iPhone and Apple's asking if they could, if you'll tell them where you are. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. The assumption of privacy is just that an assumption. You know, we live in a yeah. world where we're, uh, our anonymity and our, even our locations at any given time is uh, free and available for any one who really wants to pursue it. So. I think so. I think so. What's interesting about you shooting for a prolonged period of time is that you um, have opportunities to look at your work and see patterns. And, and two things mm-hmm. that have seemed to have been a motif in your work and, uh, and that you have um, compiled into bodies of work are one of men running and another, mm-hmm. another one of women twirling their hair. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about discovering that about your own work and why you why you enjoy that part of you know of of your photographic process? Twirl runs very specific, and it's almost aberrant in that I uh, more often don't really have a, a literal theme run through c- connecting pictures. But yes, indeed, with Twirl Run and some other projects. But I made a photograph of a woman twirling her hair. Once again, without forethought, just in my normal course of street photography, and uh, I made at the time I was printing on my own, and I made a sixteen twenty, and it was a good picture. It wasn't a great picture, but it was good. And then in the next week or so, I saw another woman twirling her hair, and then I made a picture, and then I made and or saw like maybe uh, this is kind of metaphorical, but also accurate. Then like two days later, I saw maybe three women twirling her hair. And then it got to a point where I uh, called my wife after one day of photographing on the street, and I told her, I think I got six or seven women twirling her 
their hair today. And then I started to notice women twirling their hair everywhere. And, all well, you know, it was common. So it manifested, it grew, percolated that way. So that's how that segment of that project world run accumulated. Men, or mostly men running, came about in a different way. For some out there reason, for many years since the 1980s, I photographed, mostly in my time as working with Phil, every man that ran by me. And I don't mean joggers, I mean men in a rush. Mm -hmm. I just did. It was like a hiccup. On my contact sheets on the reverse, I would indicate uh, the frame numbers. Most of them were not marvelous images. Some of, some of them were good. Most of them were quite pedestrian, but accurate and, you know, kind of a document of a guy running. And once again, some were pretty good, some were good, and once in a very blue moon, it would be very good. And so that's over, I don't know, maybe 15 or more years. So I had these two bodies of work. Uh, one of my great friends is uh, a man named Max Kozlov, who's uh, one of our greatest writers on photography. And he's a very special human being and thinker. Uh, I shared this work with Max one afternoon. And he, uh, he invented the idea of uh, the possibility of combining the two bodies of work, that mm. is twirl and run. And added to that, which illustrates the significance and the power and the potential of surrounding yourself with colleagues, firstly, that you love and that you trust and that are interesting. I met many years ago in Arl at the photo festival, a man named Gregor Ulf Nielsen, who is a great Swedish uh, book designer and curator. He visited New York and came to my house and I asked him if he would design a book of this work, and he immediately said yes. So, so that's how all that gelled into a, well, ultimately a, a book called Twirl Run. And what are the two books that are going to be coming out in the fall? I have two new books coming out, and I'm very excited. And it's just by fate, it's just by fate really, that they're happening pretty much at the same time. The first book is titled Hardened. And it's a collection of pictures from my Instagram feed, short of my texting imagery. And it's uh, edited by a, a brilliant, beautiful man named David Campany, who is a Londoner, who is one of, our, one of our greatest thinkers on photography in the moment, writers on photography and curators. And I'm blessed, honored, and flattered that he has engaged to be the editor of that project called uh, Hardened that will be published by Morel Books in London. And it's on their website, M-O-R-E-L Books. Dot com. There will be 315 pictures in that book. Oh, wow. There's a brilliant, I think, uh, syntax flow sequencing uh, that David really gave birth to because I, I have hundreds upon hundreds and more than a thousand pictures in my feed. Uh, so that was a very formidable task that I knew I needed to engage with other people. That's my first book, and that will be the trade edition. Uh, there will be a very special, really in a sense, not for sale, maybe edition of three or four of what Aaron Morrell, the publisher, is calling the Mega Mammoth book, which will be roughly 16, uh, 16 by 20 inches in dimension. When you open it, it will be bound with screws, and it will have over a thousand images in it, nearly my complete Instagram feed. Wow. Uh, so amazing. it'll be like an object, and the New York wow. Public Library uh, will have one in their collection for viewing by the public. So that is my project called Hardened. And my other project is, is way different, although it relates to me as a street photographer. Uh, I'm working with a book, working on the completion of a book with TBW Books uh, out in Oakland, California. And they're doing a book of mine titled Arena. I had the very fortunate, extraordinary commission to photograph at the Barclay Center in Brooklyn, New York, which is a very big uh, Madison Square equivalent, let's say, in Brooklyn. I went to over 350 events at the arena over nearly four years. And we've created uh, this book called Arena from that body of work. And the, and the book uh, does not really include pictures of stage. I, I photograph stage performances and so on and, and sporting events and so on. But the book is really, will be really constituted primarily of, uh, uh, of fans, uh, visitors, uh, onlookers. So it really is a, uh, a street photographer's depiction of a modern uh, arena in, in recent time. And it's going to be a bit, it's going, part of me is going to be a big, beautiful book, like 13 inches in the wide. So it's going to be really nice. Well, I look forward to seeing both of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, my last question that I ask each yeah. guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or yeah. someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Well, I, 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 think, I think Paul Graham 
is someone that needs to be uh, absorbed and thought about. Uh, I, I just love that uh, Graham so intelligently and brilliantly is pushing, uh, let, let's call it straight photography, but he's, he's also a conceptual photographer, uh, but he holds the reins and, and, and walks that fine line in a very intriguing, very brilliant way, I think. Well, it, it, would be, it would be Paul Graham. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to, to have a chance to s- sit and talk with you extensively. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and well, uh, thank you so much for making time for us. Oh, no, you're welcome. Thanks to Jeff for spending time with us. To find out more about Jeff and his work, visit jeffmermelstein.com and follow him at Instagram at Jeff Mermelstein. And you can show your support of the Candor Frame by writing a review in the iTunes store. You may have just happened upon the show, but many others use iTunes to search for photo podcasts. It's hard to stand out among the dozens of shows that are out there. Your reviews can make a big difference between a listener finding us or not. If you believe in the uniqueness of the show and think it's worthy of attention, take the time to write a short review today. It makes a big difference. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help us to not only meet the costs of production for the show, but also improve our podcast, YouTube channel, and website. Or if you just want to make a one-time contribution to the show, you can do so via PayPal. You'll find links for both on the Candid Frame website or show notes. Thanks to Sandy Coggle and Ann Walker for their recent donations to the show. You guys are awesome. Thank you. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. Not only will you immediately receive the latest episode on your phone or tablet, but you can now easily share your favorite episodes on your social networks and help spread the word. And if you want to drop me a line with comments or suggestions for the show, you can email me directly from the app. Download it today by clicking on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at X. And this is X, and this is The Candid Frame.